Chapter 5 Investigating the Forest of Flight The Forest of Flight exhibit was in a building that stood 40 feet high. Because of its enormous dorm roof, the building always made Noah think of a giant igloo. The walls and roof were made of the same tinted glass that was used on the windows of fancy cars. The exhibit was open. People could walk among freely flying birds. The moment Noah strolled through the entrance, the earthy smell of soil and tree bark invaded him. Trees and flowery plants filled the dome with fragrance and rich oxygen. Small waterfalls cascaded down rocks and threw mist into the air. The forest of flight looked and felt like a miniature jungle. Birds soared overhead and a variety of sounds echoed off the walls. Water splashing, children laughing, streams rumbling, and birds chirping and squawking. A poster with a chart was pinned to the wall near the entrance, displaying pictures of 50 different birds, just as Megan had described. Noah stopped for a minute to, to search the chart. Halfway down, he recognized one of the birds and gasped. It had a blue body, a bright red bill, and an orange belly. Without doubt, this was the tiny bird that had flown into his room. The chart said it was a Malachite kingfisher named Marlo. Marlo, Noah said aloud. He looked to the true tops. Marlo, are you in here? He headed down a misty path where enormous umbrella leaves draped above him like a live green ceiling. Droplets of water plopped on his shoulders and the top of his head. Around him, a variety of birds perched on branches and steel beams, while a few floated on streams and ponds and others pecked at the seeds on the ground, looking more bored than hungry. Noah scoured the forest of flight for Marlo but couldn't find him. His search led him to a concrete wall, the wall that had the holes in it, which was what he'd come to see. The holes were about 10 feet up from the ground and eight inches across. They were dark. The kind of dark that someone could keep secrets in. Noah took a seat on the bench that Megan had written about. He folded his hands across his lap and sat, said under his breath, This is where Megan sat not long ago. The thought of her sitting here alone made him sad. Noah watched the wall and waited. And waited and waited. Birds flew in and out of the holes. One had a beak full of straw, and Noah guessed that it was building a nest. He continued to sit and watch. An hour later, a voice announced through a loudspeaker that the zoo was preparing to close. Within minutes, people had cleared out of the forest of flight. Noah was alone. If something significant was going to take place, he thought it might be now. More time passed. Except for the chirps and fluttering of the birds, the building was silent. Now that Noah was alone in the building, it seemed larger than ever. Through the glass walls, he watched the sky dim as the sun fell into its autumn slumber. Noah began to wonder, or worry, that he might be locked in the zoo for the night. Suddenly, a tiny bird swooped down and perched on a branch directly in front of him. It had a blue body, a red beak, and an orange belly. Marlow? The bird cocked his head, first to one side and then to the other. He ruffled his feathers and blinked so many times in a split second that Noah couldn't count the blinks. The boy rose from the bench. Marlo, do you, do you understand me? Marlo cocked his head back and forth again and leaped into the air. He circled a clump of trees and landed back on the branch in front of Noah. Noah's jaw dropped. He glanced over his shoulder. As far as he could tell, he was alone. Alone with Marlo. This is really happening, he said. Marlo sprang off the branch and left it trembling. He darted through the air and disappeared into one of the holes. How deep are those things? Noah wondered. He stepped forward, wrapped his hands around a rail, and locked his gaze on the hole, waiting. Come on, Marlo, he mumbled. The zoo's got to be closing, and I... Marlo shot out of the hole, etched another circle in the air, and landed on an open branch. Noah's attention bounced between the bird and the hole. A minute later, another bird darted out. This one was green, with a yellow beak. The idea occurred to Noah that he should be taking notes the way Megan had done. He plucked a pen from his jacket and wrote on the edge of Megan's notepaper, Marlow and Green Bird. A few minutes later, a bird with long wings emerged from the hole. Under Green Bird, Noah wrote, Bird, Long Wings. A fourth and fifth bird flew from the hole. Noah simply scrawled the numbers four and five. He waited, keeping his gaze fixed on the wall and his pen poised on the paper, but nothing happened. He started to wonder whether anything more than this was going to take place. Five birds had appeared, but they seemed insignificant. All of a sudden, more birds shot out of the hole. Each went directly on the tail of the bird ahead of it. They were flying so close to one another that they blurred together in a stream of colorful feathers. In a matter of seconds, hundreds of birds filled the forest of flight. 
They dived through the tree treetops, perched on the branches, and skimmed the glass walls. Their wings made so much noise that Noah dropped Megan's paper and plugged his ears. He felt as though he was in a dream, a dream that was at once strange and magnificent and terrifying. What's happening? he hollered. He closed his eyes and braced himself for what would be next. The birds flew around him, fanning his skin with mild gusts of wind, making him feel as if he were standing in the center of a tiny tornado. The experience was exciting and frightening. He didn't know if he should scream in panic or scream in delight, so he just screamed. Ah! Chirping, whistling, squawking, and cawing, the birds circled him and filled the forest of flight with their strange musical chatter. Their feathers brushed his cheeks. Noah had no sense of how much time was passing, several seconds or many minutes. He became certain that he would be carried off, that the birds would try to squeeze him into the hole in the wall and take him to some unknown place. But a moment later, the noises stopped and the air became still. Noah heard only the gurgling streams and splashing waterfalls. He opened his eyes. Leaves and feathers floated around him like ash from a campfire. He looked up at the hole just in time to see the last few birds plunge back into it. As effortlessly as they had filled the exhibit, they had exited. Those that had been there throughout the day went about their normal business, circling treetops and munching seeds. The hole in the wall looked ordinary. A bird coasted out of it, snatched some twigs, and flew back inside. Wait, Marlo! Noah scanned the treetops. He saw no sign of the bird. Marlo, what happened? I... The sound of footsteps rose in the distance. A man with a ball-shaped belly plodded up to Noah, wagging his finger and saying, Young man, what are you doing here? The zoo's closing. Excuse me? Noah said. He snatched up Megan's note and slipped it into a pocket in his pants. You want to get locked in here? Come with me. Let's go. The man scanned the exhibit. Noah saw his eyes rest briefly on the hole in the wall. He put his hand on the boy's back and escorted him to the door. Once outside, Noah rushed toward the zoo exit. He was so confused that he felt sick. So much had happened in just a few hours. He pushed through the clutches of the turnstile, raced across the parking lot, and ran down the sidewalk next to Walker's Boulevard. At his house, he dropped on the couch and sat almost without moving until his parents returned home. He spent the evening in a daze and went to bed before dark. Night fell, but he was unable to sleep. He lay in bed, scanning the shadows in the half-moon light that filtered through the window, thinking about the events at the zoo. His gaze happened upon his jacket, which he tossed onto a chair. He saw something sticking out of the pocket, something he hadn't put there. He climbed out of bed, walked to the chair, thrust his hand into the pocket, and pulled out a piece of crumpled paper. This time, it was exactly what he expected. Another note from his sister. During the commotion at the forest of flight, a bird must have slipped it into his pocket. He smoothed out the paper and sat on his bed to read it. When he finished, he clutched it to his chest and he declared, I cannot do this alone. He knew he had to find help. That meant it was time to round up the bravest kids he knew. It was time to call on the Action Scouts.